Research or CNECPD, and because this is an accreditation event, that means um, you need to sign in and sign out. You can do it via your badge at the door, or if you're non sidra you need to sign in the register actually as you enter and as you exit. Um, yeah, um, we, Dr. Mansa Sadek is going to introduce today's speakers, and there are five of them today. And I will just leave it up to him to do that. Thank you. I should also say that uh, Dr. Sadek is the uh, chair of the Grand Run Steering Committee. I okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Um, whoever doesn't know me, it's Monza Sadek. I'm the uh, chief of women anesthesiology at SIDRA, and I'm the chair of the uh, Grand Round Committee. And it is a privilege and an honor to introduce such uh, an elite uh, speakers who's, who are going to educate us and speak to us about uh, Islamic bioethics and, uh, uh, and talking about a very important subject that link uh, Islamic bioethics and, and genome. Uh, I will definitely uh, let uh, Professor Ghali, who is, um, is not on, only uh, um, an elite uh, professor in Islamic bioethics, but he's a colleague and a friend and we consider him as part of Sidra family. He used to come and uh, teach us uh, for a long period of time. I mean, since I get to know him at least four years ago to, uh, to come to Sidra and speak about uh, abortion, <coughs> that means some of the, the, the difficult subject and that, that is usually concerning for the women's services and for the, the, the neonates as well, uh, and end of life and all of the interesting subjects. So I will... Uh, uh, let him come to the stage and introduce the, uh, the, the elite colleagues who are going to uh, lecture us today. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Good morning. <coughs> I am very happy to be here again. This is not the first time to be here in Sidra, uh, but this time is a special one because I'm not the only one who is speaking. We are organizing this uh, as part of the... Uh, uh, public events organized by the Research Center for Islamic uh, Legislation and Ethics at Hamad bin Khalifa University, this time in collaboration with uh, many other organizations, including SIDRA, Qatar Genome Program, WISH. Uh, 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 <coughs> so we are very happy uh, to be here. I'm very happy to be with the uh, a group of uh, friends and uh, great experts, uh, Dr. Iman Sadun from the Ministry of Health, if any of you um, uh, will have to deal with something about regulations for healthcare research here in Qatar, then uh, this is the key uh, to get into this, Dr. Iman Sadoun. Uh, Dr. Khaled Fakhru, I think, is uh, a well-known face here in uh, Sidra, and uh, uh, professor also at Will Cornell, Dr. Uh, Saeed Ismail, the uh, manager of the Qatar Genome uh, Program, and Dr. Khaled Lali, one of the pioneer geneticists here in uh, Qatar, and now working at the Ministry of Education. I welcome them all, and uh, I'm sure uh, it will be an enriching experience for myself and for everybody here today. <clears throat> we will uh, start uh, the following way. I will say uh, my own uh, talk. Uh, I will try to be as brief as possible. And then we will follow with the other uh, uh, speakers. Uh, Dr. Khaled Fakhru will follow me to speak about genomics in general, the field. And then um, uh, Dr. Khaled Lali and Dr. Iman Saadoun will speak about the regulations at the international and national levels. Dr. Saeed Ismail will will uh, speak about the Qatar uh, genome program and how they deal with the topic that we address today. And then myself, I will conclude with few words and then we open the floor for discussion. Uh, so now I start the few words I have uh, prepared uh, for uh, today. Islamic ethics and genomics, specialized knowledge as public discourse. Uh, 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 when it comes to, um, uh, to uh, sorry, when it comes to uh, Islamic ethics, uh, uh, the scope of Islamic ethics is very vast and wide. So uh, um, uh, it goes throughout the different cycles of life and death, in between and before even. Uh, 
So we have questions related to what happens before that the person comes to life, uh, discussions like about abortion, uh, prenatal genetic testing, and all this stuff during life, the physician-patient relationship and medical treatment, uh, uh, determining the time of death when it comes to, uh, is it uh, brain death, cardiac death, etc., uh, uh, palliative care, uh, and even after death when it comes to organ uh, transplantation and this uh, stuff. So the scope is very big. That's why it's very difficult to think of Islamic ethics as anything but uh, involving and interacting with the, re with the general public because uh, when it comes to ethics in general and Islamic ethics in particular, uh, um, the issues are just too many and too big and, and um, happening almost at uh, every uh, period in person's life. And because of the wide scope of the issues and the urgency of these issues and the need to have an answer to this, uh, uh, there is uh, the phenomenon of what we call Sheikh Google uh, in uh, Islamic studies, one of the phenomena that we study. Uh, if you don't give an answer, people will not wait. They are impatient and they will try to Google and to find an answer for this. Uh, with all the risks in, uh, involved, what, what type of answers uh, they will find. So Islamic ethics are getting public uh, 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 as a reality, not, not, not as how it should be, but how, how it is. Uh, the scope of genomics is the same thing. Uh, um, uh, n now this is more, uh, more or less how we look at, at, at the human body. The human body is uh, uh, not anymore um, the organs and the tissues, but the, uh, it's the ACTGs. It's, uh, it's the, the letters, uh, the code uh, that we try to decipher, to crack, in order to find what's happening in the body, how is the body functioning, or why is it not functioning at a specific points. And um, uh, the omics uh, have um, um, found, uh, has found its way to to uh, the terminology of, 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 of medicine and, and, and clinical practice. Uh, we have uh, neurogenomics, neurogenetics, we have oncogenomics, we have the pharmacogenomics. So um, uh, it's also um, uh, very wide. It's not only when a specialization, when it comes to dealing with the body from a medical perspective or a scientific perspective. And it's even not only the body. It's, uh, as they say, cracking the code of life. It's not only about disease and health. It's about uh, it's about one's history, one's past, uh, in in a very remote way. It's about one's present. It's about one's future. What type of children uh, will we have if I married with X or Y? And again, the the the, the issue of uh, Google again. Um, uh, the one at the left side. This is a photo, a recent photo in New York Times uh, with uh, an, an, an article which made a lot of controversy the last time called Dr. Google is a liar. So uh, uh, it seems physicians have also their concerns about Google and how medical information are being uh, searched and sold and used uh, by the general public, uh, more or less like the same concerns we have about uh, Sheikh Google. So also, information about genomics, when it comes to one's health, one's disease, we have now the phenomenon of direct-to-consumer um, genetics and genomics. Things are getting public, and we cannot stop this as Islamic study specialists or as biomedical scientists or as uh, physicians. So the, uh, the intersection between Islamic um, ethics and the public discourse, the, the, its part in this intersection between Islamic ethics and genomics is getting more and more part of the, of the public discourse. One of the best ways to address this, which is a reality now, as we say, uh, uh, is to uh, use specialized knowledge in order to enlighten people, to guide them, to tell them what are the best options available so that they can choose from them uh, based on informed consent, based on um, uh, solid information. I can tell you when, uh, um, if we speak about just five years ago, we are 
much better uh, in a much better position uh, when it comes to uh, specialized knowledge about the intersection of Islamic ethics and, ge and genomics. Uh, uh, we are much better now than uh, about a couple of years ago. We have produced, uh, we have some knowledge uh, available, uh, some research uh, published or being published that can uh, help us uh, uh, produce something uh, that can be of benefit for the general public and that can enrich and guide the public discourse. Uh, this is uh, one of the, um, um, uh, what we, we say, early studies. It's a recent one, but it's one of the early studies in the field, uh, uh, genomics in the Gulf region and Islamic ethics. It's uh, one of the WISH reports, World Innovative Summit for Health. Uh, it was produced, I think, 2016, uh, and uh, copies of the report are available outside. Uh, um, so the report focused on one of the issues, uh, one of the thorny issues in the field of uh, genomics as a field of research or a, even a, in, in the clinical uh, context about the ethical management of incidental findings from an Islamic ethical perspective. Uh, the, most, the, the more recent one here is this book, Islamic Ethics and the Genome Question, uh, uh, which addressed uh, m many, many questions from um, raised uh, uh, in the field of of genomics from an Islamic uh, uh, perspective. The book is available as open access. You can download the, holy uh, the whole book uh, for free from this, um, from this address. And you can have a look at physical copies, I believe, also outside. Uh, uh, we have also now, um, uh, from our College of Islamic Studies, from our center, we um, established Journal of Islamic Ethics. A great part of it is the dedicated to um, um, uh, bioethical issues from an Islamic perspective, opened this uh, emerging field for uh, uh, new uh, research. Also for education, we have now an MA program in uh, our college. By the way, most of you, I think you can see it from your window. The very beautiful white building at the other side. Uh, so there are also buildings competing about their beauty with Sidra building. So uh, 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 in the Islamic studies program, we have the uh, um, uh, track or concentration Islamic thought and applied ethics, where we also pay attention uh, to uh, the bioethical issues, the issues of genetics and genomics, etc. Uh, um, uh, through this uh, specialized knowledge, we, we can go into this public discourse. Uh, we believe that we are now in a moment that we can use what have been produced so far and what will be produced soon in order to um, um, engage in, 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 in a public uh, discourse. One of the key issues in the public discourse is gaining trust. This is not something about the Muslim world in particular. This is not about Islamic ethics in particular. This is about everyone. If you don't gain, gain the trust of the public, you cannot do proper research. You cannot achieve success in the society. You can have no guarantee about uh, the consequences of what you are doing in the lab or in the, in the hospital. Uh, um, uh, uh, in order to gain this uh, public trust, uh, um, uh, there are uh, practical questions to be answered. Uh, what the individuals as research subjects uh, or potential research subjects or as patients or as family members or as society members in general, they have questions that need answers. Some of these questions are practical to the point. Uh, they need answers for these questions like um, 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 uh, what is this field that everybody is talking about? Uh, um, in genomics, what is what is actually possible? What is in reality possible? Uh, what is just a fallacy and a myth that uh, that is not happening and maybe will never happen? Uh, differentiating between what's possible, what's potential, and what's unrealistic uh, uh, is very important for the people, and it needs uh, well-grounded information. And I believe uh, Dr. Khalid will try to elaborate a little bit uh, on these issues. But we need much more about these issues about how to regulate the informed consent. And speaking about the regulations, we will have two talks uh, today uh, telling us how this can be um, the link between the specialists working in the, in the field, the genomicists or geneticists, and, and the general public, how this relationship can be concerned in order to avoid any legal conflicts in the future. We will hear two talks today about this. Issue of privacy and confidentiality, ownership of samples and resulting data, 
return of results and incidental findings, as I mentioned, gene therapy, genetic tests, etc. These are practical questions that need answers. If you don't provide well-informed answers based on credible sources and information, we will not be able to gain the public trust of the people. But it's not only about the practical and direct questions, there are also deep questions. Uh, which um, uh, what genomics has done uh, um, uh, outside the labs, outside the hospitals, in the field of ethics, and uh, people working in the field of ethics like ourselves realize this very well, has raised very deep questions about uh, our own ontology uh, and epistemology, about our being, about our theory of knowledge. How do we think with the field of medicine itself, telos or objectives of medicine? Uh, uh, we use to understand medicine as, as a field which will interfere when we have a problem. So I will go to the hospital if I'm sick. That, this is what we have usually thought throughout history. <laughs> But now, because of the knowledge, the new knowledge that we now have access to, and the new knowledge that may be produced soon, we are much more interested now in shape, reshaping ourselves. We want to be much better than what we are, which we call in the ethics enhancement. So we try to go much beyond the, the, the treatment that I am sick and I want to treat, but I'm not happy with what I am now, even if I look perfect. Uh, I, 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 I can run fast, but I need to do this much, much faster than it is now. I want to have much better genes for my memory, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, wh wh what is medicine? How, how should medicine look like in the future? What should I as an individual expect from uh, medicine and from physicians in the future? About our human body, um, um, we had a period uh, 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 what we call genetic determinism. Uh, we are just our own genes, and our genes are determining everything. Now, with epigenetics and similar fields, we think that no, it's even environment that shape our genes and how they function, what's on, what's off, etc. Um, uh, uh, behavior and liability. Uh, how much are we are are we responsible for what we are doing and the concept of taklif in the Islamic tradition? So these are um, 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 uh, big and deep questions that we will also, uh, we have to be busy with in the, in the coming period. Uh, uh, as part of uh, our collaboration, long-term collaboration with Qatar Genome Program, uh, um, besides the things that we organize together like what we do uh, today, uh, they also um, have maybe Dr. Saeed in his uh, presentation will speak about this path towards personalized medicine. They have, uh, this is a funding um, uh, program. Uh, uh, through this uh, program, uh, which is part of the Qatar National Research Fund, uh, we got a um, uh, research uh, grant uh, on um, genomics, Islamic ethics, and public engagement towards bridging the knowledge and communication gaps. This is a follow-up grant for an earlier grant we had. Uh, uh, from QNRF, which produced the book that I uh, spoke about. And it, it's, we started uh, 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 a couple of months ago. This is our target in order to bridge uh, this uh, uh, communication uh, gap in the uh, future, inshallah. I will stop here so that my colleagues also can have uh, uh, their uh, uh, talks. I invite Dr. Khaled. And after this, uh, Dr. Khaled as well, Dr. Khaled Lali, and after this, Dr. Iman, and then Dr. Saeed, and then we all come together to uh, uh, the stage to uh, answer your uh, questions. Thank you very much, and I leave you, leave you now with uh, Dr. Khaled Fakhro. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to thank everyone for, uh, for showing up and thank um, Dr. Ghali for this invitation. Can you hear me okay? Or am I too close to the mic? Okay, great. Uh, so um, I was tasked with trying to communicate science to a wide-ranging audience, which is not my forte. I tend to get too technical, so we'll see how this one goes. Um, so I have no financial interest to disclose, and here are the learning objectives that I was um, um, going to ask to, uh, to cover. Uh, to make the public understand the terms genomics and next-generation sequencing, and to learn about how genomics technologies are now affecting all these areas, disease diagnosis, fetal testing, precision treatment, gene therapy, genome editing, and in vitro, fertilized, uh, in vitro fertilization. Um, and then to explore the ethical issues, so I'm gonna pose some ethical questions after each of these vignettes. And uh, at the end, I'd wanna try to wrap it together by what we have here at SIDRA. 
Um, so what are genomics and genomic technologies? So I can't start a talk as a human geneticist without giving you the central dogma of human genetics, which is DNA becomes RNA becomes protein, and this is probably something that you learned in high school biology. Um, we now know that this uh, picture is uh, vastly incomplete. There's a lot of reverse transcription that takes place, so RNA can become DNA. Um, and then the genome, the transcriptome, and the proteome are also complemented by the epigenome, so what nature does to your genome in, in order to regulate it. There's a lot of non-coding RNAs, things that are transcribed but never become protein-coding genes. There's the metabolome, so the output of all your proteins and your microbiome, which is uh, the vast community of flora that lives on you. In fact, there's 10 to 1 flora on you than human cells. So you're technically just a vessel for bacteria. Um, and then there's these, all, all these other omics that, um, you know, that play a, a, a pretty big role in our, in our understanding of health and disease, how our environment is, um, um, you know, how our phenotypes are, and how our lifestyle is. And all of this is going to become information um, that needs to be integrated and try to understand health and disease. Um, so I'd like to show this picture because it shows you um, the difference between if you were using single omics, so single technologies, you would only see one part um, you know, of the bigger picture. So you'd, you'd, you'd look at the tusk and you'd think it's a spear, uh, or you'd look at the, the trunk, uh, sorry, I mean the leg and you'd think it's a tree. But with multi-omics, you get the idea that you're looking at a huge animal. And this is how our understanding of biology is now changing um, from um, you know, single technologies to a multi-omic approach. So let's talk about genome sequencing. Um, almost everybody in this room is going to be familiar with Sanger sequencing. This is what happens when you send a sample to the lab to try to confirm if a mutation is there. Um, and this works muta one mutation at a time. Um, the big revolution uh, was with next generation sequencing. What next generation sequencing does is it takes all the DNA that you have in your cell, it chops it up into tiny bits, and then it massively parallel sequences all of them. Um, and then at the end, uh, you end up stitching them together by overlaps, and you end up regenerating your genome. So there's a lot of bioinformatics involved. But to give you an idea of scale, and I'm sorry if you've seen this before, but this, this is just for people in the audience who do not really know what this means for us as an innovation. Um, Sanger sequencing, which was developed in 1977, Fred Sanger got the Nobel Prize for it. It sequences 500 bases at a time. And to assemble the first human genome, it took 13 years of sequencing and over $2.7 billion of money just that went into reagents. Today, with next generation sequencing, we get 90 billion bases of, um, uh, of DNA. So we can actually sequence a human genome in two days, and it costs us about $1,000. So with the same price that you, the same amount of money you spend on a first human genome, you can sequence 2.7 million people today. Um, so that changes everything. So I'll just tell you a little bit about what we learned. So our human genome is 3.2 billion bases long, if you didn't know this already. But to bring that number into um, you know, um, less abstract terms, 3.2 billion is huge. That's the number of seconds in 100 years. That's 3.2 billion. And one genome takes about 200 gigabytes of space. So if you have a normal hard drive, you can only put one copy of a genome on it. So for people you know, working with large data sets, like the, you know, the Qatar Genome Program has already sequenced 10,000 genomes. You can imagine how much data that is. Um, only 1% of our genome is coding genes, shocker. So many people did not expect that our genome was mostly non-coding. Um, each of us has about four to five million mutations. Two to eight of these mutations are heter in heterozygous state for recessive disease, so we're all carriers of recessive disease burden. And three to 10 of our genes are completely knocked out. So we're all walking knockouts of genes, um, but we're, for the most part, normal, I hope. Um, so yes, we, we answer a lot of questions, but there's still some questions that we can't answer. And that's what the future of genetics is going to be about. Um, so let's go back to this, um, to this image real quick. So I just talked to you about genomics, but there's transcriptomics, there's epigenomics, there's proteomics, there's metabolomics, and each one of these omics, and you're gonna be hearing more and more about these uh, um, you know, in the future, is just taking that one discipline and then scaling it. And um, you know, this is what the picture is going to look like. You're going to have your, your patient, and then you're going to do all this work up for it. And so for the bioethicists in the room, each one of these is going to be an entire discipline. So think of this as job security. Um, so, um, yeah, so let's talk about um, you know, some vignettes of the use of genomic technologies um, uh, now. So uh, in diagnosis, you, is anyone here familiar with the diagnostic odyssey? No one, no one's heard the word diagnostic odyssey, one person, well, the genetic counselors in the room know about it, okay. Um, so no, we're not talking about Homer's Odyssey, um, and if you haven't read it, it's fascinating. Uh, we're talking about this. So this is basically 
um, what the patient goes through just to get a diagnosis. So patients with rare diseases are, you know, spend a notoriously long time trying to find a diagnosis for their rare disease. Um, this is another infographic that kind of summarizes it. So there's 7,000 rare diseases that are known. Um, um, each of these patients sees on average eight physicians, and they get an, on average three missed diagnoses over their lifetime. Um, and then, um, uh, you know, uh, some studies tracking stress and anxiety both in patients and in caregivers, surprisingly, show that there's a very high amount of stress on both sides of this question. 21% of patients with rare diseases had to borrow money just to get a diagnosis. And this infographic shows five plus years, but it's actually closer to eight years. Um, this diagnostic odyssey of a person running around with their child trying to get a diagnosis. Um, so contrast that in the old age to this. So this is the Guinness um, um, world record set for the fastest diagnosis. This is with next generation sequencing. And you can skip all that up there. Just look down here. A patient came into the clinic and got diagnosed in 19.5 hours. That means that as you wait when the child's on the NICU, you can probably get a diagnosis. And that's something that we're trying to bring to SIDRA. Um, but there's a ton of ethical questions related to diagnostic odyssey. For example, is genome sequencing a right or a privilege? And should I have a copy of my genome? Should I own it? Should every sick patient have their genome sequenced? And if so, who pays for this test? And who owns that data? Um, what, what do you do with all this information? Who do you inform about the risk? And if a mother is pregnant, can she and should she test her fetus for future, um, uh, future mutations? How about if a disease is late onset, like something that happens in adolescence, like in mean, adolescent neurogeneration, like Lafour or Batten? Um, do you or should you test your younger children? Um, so whole genome sequencing, again, has a lot of information that it gives you. And uh, uh, as, uh, as Dr. Ghali alluded to earlier, there's a lot of secondary findings in whole genome sequencing. You're not just testing one locus. You're testing all the genes. And you're going to learn a lot about a person, and are you obliged to report that? Um, so let's talk about advances in non-invasive fetal testing. So many of you are familiar with this procedure, amniocentesis. Uh, it's a laborious and extremely risky technical procedure. It's extremely technical and um, um, in a risky procedure uh, to test for fetal abnormalities. And the, uh, the risk of miscarriages or other complications is about 1 in 200 to 1 in 400. Uh, now, we can now replace that because we found out using omics technologies that fetal DNA circulates in the maternal blood. And so if you want to, you can grab an aliquot of maternal blood, you can test the fetal section in that aliquot, and then you can diagnose the baby based on that. So NIPT is possible now due to the speed and sensitivity of genome sequencing. So this is how an innovation is helping NIPT. It can be performed as early as 10th week, uh, but usually they wait, they wait until um, 15 weeks of gestation. Uh, the accuracy obviously differs depending on what you're looking for, and I'm, I'm going to show you this table real quick. So for trisomy 21, this is pretty good, but for the other trisomies, um, you have um, you know, lower sensitivity and specificity, uh, which, which brings up the issue of what do you do with, with negatives. False negatives are going to be a big problem here. You tell a mom that she doesn't have this condition, and then the child ends up having that condition. Uh, and of course, negative is only testing one mutation, so it doesn't necessarily mean healthy child. So some questions that are brought up here. Should every mother have an NIPT test? Is it a right or a privilege? And who pays for this test? And should a mother abort a child due to a genetic condition? So for example, the Down syndrome community says, what is wrong with, ch with children who have Down syndrome? There's nothing wrong with them. Um, so why would you even get tested for that? And how early in pregnancy um, should abortions be permissible? And that's a question for the ethicists. Uh, and so again, how, how to deal with false positives and false negatives. So let's move on to treatment selection. Uh, so the central premise of pharmacogenomics is that drugs need to bind or be metabolized in a specific manner to function properly, um, and that patients, you know, different individuals, metabolize or respond differently based on their individual genes. So this is a good example of this. So you have a big patient group here, um, uh, and um, if you give them all the same treatment, you're going to get trial and error. Some of them are going to respond, some of them are not. Whereas if you add a genetic test before that treatment, you can then stratify individuals for th those who require a normal dose, those who require a higher dose or lower dose or those who actually require an alternative medication because the current medication doesn't work for their genes. Um, and, um, you know, you can think of doing this for basically all drugs on the market. So you can take a group of individuals and start DNA testing them in a massively parallel way. And, um, you know, in a matter of hours or days, you can stratify your patient population into those that are going to be good responders, those that are going to have bad side effects, and those that are not going to respond at all. Um, and, um, uh, um, Similar trends are seen in cancer. So, um, you know, the way that cancer works is um, tumors are going to be defined by their driver mutations, not by tissue of origin. 
uh, and that drugs should target the molecular pathway, not the growth symptom of cancer, not the tumor itself. And a single cancer cell um, um, uh, you know, acquires its proliferative advantage by a driver mutation. So this is just a schematic showing like one, one cell that gets a driver mutation by a spontaneous mutation, and then it drives a proliferative advantage, so the cell starts growing into a tumor. And then the cell will continue uh, dividing uncontrollably, and as it divides, it acquires all these other mutations because it's not controlling its cell division. And so by the end, when the tumor becomes metastatic and you start looking at the tumor in different tissues, there's going to be tons and tons of mutations. How do you know which mutation you're supposed to address? And the idea is that the drug should target um, this driver mutation because that's the mutation that's been causing cancer. So um, we need to target driver mutations, and the way to discover them Today, I mean, you know, previously it was very difficult to discover driver mutations in metastatic disease, but today you can actually sequence these tumors and then count the number of times you see all these mutations, and using bioinformatics you can go back to what was a driver mutation. And the idea is that some of these driver mutations already have known inhibitors and drugs, uh, and targeting those genes is definitely more effective than chemotherapy and all its side effects. And one example of this is the, uh, the NTRK gene, uh, which recently made the news because it's responsible, it's a single gene that's responsible for 12 types of cancer, but um, you can target with a drug, you can target that gene. So if you go in, regardless of the tissue of origin of your cancer, if you have that mutation, we can give you this drug. And so this is um, um, you know, basically precision cancer therapy. Again, some ethical questions, should, should, cancer, um, should every cancer patient get tumor sequencing? And who pays for this test? And so the, the cancer geneticists will definitely advocate for this. Um, should family members also get tested? And how do you deal with false positives and, and, and false negatives? And for pharmacogenetics, should normal people, should you and I be screened the moment we walk into the hospital for all possible drug interventions? Um, and if some drugs may cause death if administered in wrong doses, who's at fault if a patient has this rare mutation that no one knew about and he dies from a normal dose? Um, so the final section is, is, on, is, is on gene therapy and genome editing. So gene therapy replaces a defective copy of a gene, so um, you, you package your, your normal copy of the gene into a virus and then use that virus to infect the cells, and you hope that that DNA is going to get incorporated into the cell so the cell can start making the vector. Uh, the limitation is that it only works for loss of function mutations, so you can only make, uh, you can only introduce normal copies of the gene um, when the normal gene is effective, and that's not all diseases have loss of function mutations. The gene needs to be replaced during the right developmental window, so if it's something that's, that's, that's happening during um, um, you know, liver development, then it should be introduced at that point and not after the liver is completely developed. And it does not correct the existing copy of the gene. So constitutively, and in terms of your future children, you still have the wrong copy of the gene. Um, you know, gene editing is also um, um, you know, now gaining some momentum, especially in the media. Uh, um, so uh, in, the, in this scenario, you end up changing a few bases of the DNA. And with this strategy, you actually change um, the gene constitutively. Um, so this is just an example of the use of CRISPR-Cas9 because it's gaining a lot of uh, uh, familiarity in the media. Um, you can either do it in vivo, so you package um, uh, you know, the CRISPR into uh, the vesicle and you inject it into the liver, or you can do it ex vivo and you culture the cells and then you reintroduce them to the person. And again, technically it's very challenging. It's unclear if off-target effects cause other diseases, and it's very expensive. IPS technologies are another thing where um, we're reprogramming your own cells to become pluripotent, and we're using those um, to make any type of cell we want, any type of organ we want that's specifically tailored to you. So this has um, a lot of benefits for organ rejection, but it also is extremely time consuming. And then finally, you probably heard about this for people working uh, in, in, in maternal fetal health. With a three-way IVF, you get, um, um, you know, you can, you can use a, uh, the mother's egg to get the nucleus if the mother has an abnormal mitochondria, and you can use the nucleus from a mother, um, the nucleus from the father, but use an egg from a third mom. Um, and so what does that, what, what's the relationship of that mother to you as a child? So all of these pose lots of ethical questions. For example, if you limit the types of diseases, um, you know, which are, which are the types of diseases um, that should receive gene therapy or gene editing? What happens if you treat one disease and end up causing another? Um, genome editing is heritable. So is there a limit to how much we can change in the human race? Because if you edit it, then that's it. You changed it. And then can iPS cells be used to create another person? And can someone have three parents? And what does that mean for marriage um, jurisprudence? Um, so that's it. This is the last, um, 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 you know, the last section. I just want to tell you that at CIDRA, we have state-of-the-art genomic, state of, state of genomics course, so we can actually do all types of genomics that I, that I, um, that I just described. We also have incredible high-performance computing resources to crunch all this data, and we have our own IPS and genome editing facilities up in research. 
Um, so uh, with all this together, we're launching a precision medicine program, et cetera, where we're trying to, to combine high quality clinical care with enrollment into research to high resolution molecular profiling and eventually converge on precision guided um, clinical decision making. So um, with that, I, I guess my time is up. We're, we're part of a bigger community and that's why ethical discourse is very important. Thank you. Thank you so much, Khaled. Thank you. And thanks for being for finishing on time. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, now we will move to the uh, issue of regulations. We will start with the international experience with uh, Dr. Khaled Al Ali. Please, Dr. <laughs> it was uh, well played at both sides, sport-wise and uh, moral and ethically. <laughs> yes. um, uh, uh, the other things that I'm, I'm, you know, I think that Victor? we can ask. Yeah. Yeah. Start. Okay, I'll stop here. I will not talk. I think I'm a lecturer, so I'd like to move. <laughs> uh, I think we cannot let Dr. Khaled do his work without some kind of regulations. <laughs> so that uh, regulation has been thought by, uh, you know, several uh, international uh, entities and by a local entity. I will touch one of the international entity, which is uh, the UNESCO. I, I was serving uh, in UNESCO and I was chairing uh, one of the ethic committees there for several years, eight years there. And I was involved in the uh, declaration in uh, on human genome projects. Um, uh, the the declara declaration of, uh, I mean, you can always Google this one and get it from any sources, okay. The Universal Declaration on Human Genome and Human Rights, it's a declaration that try to balance between uh, uh, the need for what, uh, you know, uh, geneticists are doing in the field uh, of genomics and uh, the ethics and regulation that's needed. And keep in mind that uh, uh, ethics is a little bit affected by uh, cultural and religious things in each country. So the battle to uh, come with a declaration worldwide was very difficult because we have different countries, different people, and different thought of uh, things. But it took time, that's why I'd like to show you that it takes almost five years to get the declaration. It started that, you know, when the DJ of the UNESCO asked the IBC, or International Bioethic Committees, um, let me explain, UNESCO works under three umbrella, education, uh, culture and, uh, and social, and ethics is under the social part of the, uh, this one. And under the social ethics, we have three bodies. Uh, one is COMEST, which I, I was sharing, that's ethics for science and technology. And IBC, ethics uh, is international bioethics, which is more medically oriented and health-wise oriented. And then we have the intergovernmental body that takes the result of those two and try to coordinate between the countries. Uh, so uh, based on this one, uh, a draft was prepared by July 97 and is given to the intergovernmental. And then in the general, uh, by 1997, uh, the, uh, the declaration was, uh, you know, announced. And then it usually has been taken to the United Nations for a resolution in the United Nations. Uh, it's exactly like what we have done earlier for human rights, for example. Yes, in a similar uh, uh, way. Uh, of course, uh, UNESCO does not leave it at this level. There is also a follow-up and there is also implementations and they usually visit any declaration every certain uh, period uh, of time uh, revisited. Uh, the Universal Declaration have uh, uh, 25 articles 
and they group them under uh, uh, seven categories or seven group. The first one is human dignity and the human genome. Uh, the second one is right of the persons uh, concerned. Uh, three is research on the human genome. Fourth is condition for uh, the uh, exercise of scientific activities. Uh, number five is uh, solidarity and international cooperations. And then promotion of the principles. And finally, implementations of the uh, declarations. Uh, those 25 articles are divided to those uh, things. In the prelim, it's been you know, announced that this is part of UNESCO uh, works, based, based, as I said, that this is a part of the ethic uh, mission of uh, uh, UNESCO. And it also recalls some of the instrumental uh, in other domains, such as uh, intellectual properties, uh, 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 biological diversity and elimination of uh, racism and other that are done earlier in the, this field. Um, if we start, I'm not going to go over the 25 ones, so I picked some of the important things in relation to these. Uh, uh, in the principal articles, it's uh, the declaration to establish limits or uh, intervention in the genetic heritage of humanity and individual that uh, international community has a moral obligation not uh, to uh, transgress. Uh, and under this, they put three basic, uh, you know, uh, points. The first one, human genome is part of the heritage of the human dignity and humanity. Uh, respect of the dignity and human right uh, of every individual. And finally, rejections of genetic uh, determinisms or anything that segregates or uh, you know, uh, between people because of anything related to their genetic uh, background. Uh, the declaration details in the right of individual also. The second part was the individuals. A prior uh, consent to all research, and I'm quite sure the, you know, she, uh, Dr. the next speaker will uh, you know, highlight these things because we do have a lot of regulation for this in Qatar. Treatments or diagnosis, protection against uh, dis discriminations, uh, confidentiality of the genetics information that's given, uh, and the right of just uh, uh, repression for damage uh, sustained as a direct result of the uh, work done in relation to genome. Uh, also, the, pri uh, the primacy or, uh, you know, is given to the human person uh, that must not, however, work uh, to the determinants of science creations. And this, I remember that this has taken, talking, uh, took a lot of debates during, uh, you know, UNESCO's meeting. Uh, because, I don't know, a lot of times scientists look at ethicists that they are some kind of uh, obstacles for science progressions, uh, th that they put certain uh, things. So uh, the uh, declaration come with something that balance, you know, both that, you know, the human, you know, benefits and not to uh, uh, stop the science from uh, progressing uh, this thing. It takes a lot of time, a lot of countries that they were, you know, negotiating this one, but uh, finally a balanced things was uh, looking at this. Yeah. The next was the freedom of uh, research while uh, affirmed in Article 12 uh, of the Declaration being necessary to progress of knowledge and part of the freedoms uh, of thought is placed in the framework of the established uh, uh, essential protections. Uh, no research concerning human genome nor its application should uh, prevail over the respect of human rights, fundamental freedoms, and human dignity of individual were applicable in three of the uh, articles. And 
Yeah, while uh, Article 11 prescribed uh, practice contrary to human dignity, such as uh, reproductive cloning uh, uh, of human beings, it's, it was completely negative in that article, okay, though it has been revisited recently. The declaration also states that advances in biology, genetics, and medicine concerning the human genome shall be made available to all. Uh, the responsibility of researcher, but also of public and uh, private sectors, is always to, uh, you know, uh, uh, in the setting of scientific policy, emphasized in this, as well as the role of the states uh, to establish framework for uh, the free exercise of science, uh, scientific activities. And I think uh, this session is part of what we are talking, and there have been a lot of sessions uh, in this. Uh, let me tell you frankly uh, that Qatar is, uh, you know, doing a, a great job in the field of the genomics uh, in both sides, research-wise and in the part of ethics. And uh, uh, the ethic discussions of the genome started before we started the genomic. Uh, so we were very well prepared for what uh, 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 is coming. Thanks for the group that we're working. Most of them are among us uh, today. Uh, also, solidarity and international cooperations are addressed in these articles. That's why we have a lot of conferences, a lot of places, and to seek uh, some kind of uh, working uh, together as countries. Because a lot of times, genomic, uh, you find it that, it's, uh, you know, uh, we see yeah, uh, you know, there are exchange, there are sample sends, uh, other places, so you need all these, uh, you know, things. Uh, asserting the necessary safeguard uh, of the interest of individual families, population group, with particular vulnerable to or affecting of the disease or disability. So uh, it's taking care also of, uh, uh, you know, anything that uh, could, you know, touch a particular group or particular persons or uh, certain races or any of those, uh, and at the same time to enhance the research capacities for, uh, in the developing uh, nations. Uh, <coughs> Uh, the putting into practice of the declaration is primarily the responsibility of the states. So what they do in UNESCO is once the declaration is handed, it's, there is a guidelines established how countries can follow up these uh, declarations. And it has been handled to states. We have a representative of the states in the UNESCO. Uh, uh, and also an ad hoc committee is usually work with IBC in relation to IBC to follow up the implementations of these uh, norms in different countries, and also to see what are the problems so that they can face it whenever there is uh, revision of the, uh, you know, declarations. Uh, you know, you know, UNESCO is currently evaluating the impact of the declarations uh, worldwide. Uh, this was a brief going over this declaration, and uh, uh, I'm quite sure, you know, uh, the next speaker will highlight how uh, Qatar is handling uh, this one. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Khalid. Now it's uh, the turn of Dr. Iman Saadoun. We just have to fix something. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here among colleagues and uh, people at SIDRA. This is, uh, I, say, I, th I believe, my second time in SIDRA. Um, I'm going to take you away a little bit from the interesting science uh, to the boring uh, regulation, national regulation uh, in Qatar. And uh, I hope uh, the material won't be very dry for you guys. Uh, the learning objectives uh, for my presentation is uh, to talk about regional and national regulation as it comes to genomics. Uh, however, I would like to uh, speak a little bit about uh, our work at Ministry of Public Health. So I'm managing the, uh, the research division at Ministry of Public Health. The main function 
of our department is to govern the ethical conduct of research activities in Qatar as it comes to human research, animal research, and basic research. So any researchers who work in human research must be uh, familiar with the work of the IRB committee, how to submit to the IRB committee, the IACA committee, the IBC committee, depend on the type of research you're actually doing. Uh, we were successful to uh, do our role in setting forth the national policies and regulation in Qatar and to develop a sustainable system of registration of review committees and assurance of research institutions to assure us that they will adhere to national uh, policies and regulation. Um, as it comes to the regional uh, part of the regulation, uh, Actually, we did a lot of research to find out what's happening in the Arab world. So as it comes to ethical in general, uh, there has been a lot going on since uh, maybe 2006, 2004. Uh, however, in most of the Arab countries, uh, when we come and search about genomics per se, everything comes as genetic testing. Uh, so genetic testing is an old practice uh, that has been going on in most of Arab countries, uh, such as uh, premarital, premarriage, uh, uh, reproductive medicine, forensic medicine, etc. Uh, in other countries, of course, there is lots of genetic laboratories that work without any uh, regulation whatsoever. Uh, as it comes to genomics per se, uh, and according to the stability uh, of certain um, countries, uh, that helped them in developing genomic, national genomic projects, uh, such as Qatar, when um, HH has pronounced in 2013 the launch of uh, Qatar National Genome, Saudi Arabia uh, launched its program in 2013, Kuwait and United Arab Emirates did, but I'm not sure exactly when, but it's around uh, these dates. So as it comes to regional, again, uh, there are a lot of, uh, there is interest in the Arab world. Uh, there is small biobanking here and there, you can see it in some of the Arab countries, however, uh, when it comes to addressing the risk that's associated with genomics as it comes to culture, uh, religious implication that uh, Dr. Ghali has talked about, there isn't really a lot going on as we compare it to the Western world. Uh, Qatar National Genome, as uh, Dr. Uh, Saeed will talk uh, a little bit uh, about, uh, based on seven pillars, as you can see. Of course, uh, the most important one is Qatar Biobank. And uh, I will let Dr. Uh, Saeed talk about all this, but one of those pillars are the regulation. Uh, to govern the ethical conduct of any research, there has to be some regulation that regulate that research. And of course, uh, genomic research is no difference. And the Ministry of Public Health uh, state that any human research including genomic research, is subject to the basic policy of Ministry of Public Health for protection of human subjects involved in research. And if you go to our website, you're going to find a list of uh, policies and regulations that uh, govern the ethical conduct of research in Qatar, like the first one, uh, policies and regulation for human. Uh, which basically talk about the function of the IRB committee, the scope, the membership, the type of review, how they process, how to do uh, archiving, bookkeep bookkeeping, and all that. Also, there is guideline for uh, stem cell uh, research, gene transfer research, uh, collection of biological samples, how to uh, report adverse event in clinical trials, and of course, one for the genomic uh, medicine. The policy that we developed for genomic medicine really uh, has, um, has been started uh, with the launch of uh, the genomic uh, proposal uh, in 2014. Uh, at that time, uh, Her Highness asked us to communicate with the uh, Center of Islamic uh, Ethics at Hamad bin Khalifa University in June 2014, and we did uh, a meeting that was held with uh, Dr. Tari Ramadan, and uh, there was a lot of discussion that ended up with uh, a SAIL uh, report, and the, the 
take home message was uh, just be careful in following whatever is happening in the Western world. Uh, make sure that everybody has an access to the uh, benefits of the genomic research. Uh, following that collaboration, there has been a lot of several workshops, symposium, reports, um, similar to the report that Dr. Ghali has talked about a while ago. And we started to develop uh, a genomic policy. Uh, we thought it's going to be one policy, but turned out it's going to be two. Uh, I'm going to talk about genomic policy one and what was the scope of that policy. Uh, um, in January 2018, there was a meeting that has representative of all stakeholders in Qatar and Qatar National Research Ethics Committee. They approved the policy and the policy has been published in our website. Uh, the policy, basically, the scope for, for it is to assist investigator in the design and conduct of genomic research and to assist uh, IRB committees in the review and oversight and to teach them how to do mitigation of any research uh, associated with genomics, and of course to emphasize on the training and education. Uh, for the IRB committee, I'm not sure if there is any member uh, of IRB committee from CIDRA here, but uh, there, is, there are seven, oh, uh, Dr. Khaled, okay. <laughs> there are seven criteria that the IRB committee should pay attention to when they review any genomic related study. Uh, well, this has disappeared. Okay. So, the most concern, of course, or the main function of the IRB committee is protection of safety and well-being of participants. So how can the IRB committee uh, accomplish this job is to try to mitigate the risk of the genomic research through uh, maximizing the benefit, reducing the risk, make sure that there is some knowledge getting out of that research, uh, that selection of subjects uh, are equitable, and all the elements of informed consent that is mentioned in the Ministry of Public Health Space Policy are in place, and of course they have to do monitoring to ensure that quality of data uh, is in place also for privacy of subject and confidentiality of data and protection of uh, vulnerable subject. For the informed consent, uh, the policy required that uh, sufficient information has to be presented to every participant. They do understand the information. They make an informed decision and understand the consequences of their decision if they participate in genomic research. And they have the right to withdraw from the study at any time they wanted to. And of course, there is additional safeguard for vulnerable subjects like pregnant women, like children, like prisoners, like a student. In the informed consent also, there has to be some clarification about the samples itself, how they're going to uh, destroy the samples, how long the sample will be stored, is their plan future use for the sample beside the original uh, cause of the study. Uh, participant must receive assurance that their information, of course, will be confidence and in control, and they are shared. There are certain guards that uh, make sure that there will be no breach uh, of this uh, data. Participant must receive assurance that data will be monitored all the time to avoid any risk that might happen. So. Lots of risk, of course, is associated with genomics, not only as it comes to information, and uh, there will be a slide that explains more about the risk. However, the most important part is security of data, confidentiality of data. Qatar is such a small community, and everybody needs to make sure there will be no breach of their own data. So the policy presents some of the uh, guards that uh, IRB committee should ensure that these guards are in place. It is physical, technical, administrative uh, guards. 
uh, it, looks, it looks easy for everybody, uh, but it has to be in place as long as uh, genomic research is going on. Uh, as it comes to physical procedures, uh, keeping the data, of course, computer with lock, housing, uh, data servers in room with tight control, controlling access, uh, procedure must be defined who will have access, who have the combination of keys, how, uh, who has the privilege to access these data. For the technical procedure, of, uh, procedure, of course, uh, the use of technology uh, using uh, password, encryption, firewalls, all individual with access uh, must use unique uh, username, password, it changes it periodically. Uh, computer system should be designed to log off automatically, which already exists, I believe, in every single uh, in institution now after uh, what's happening with hacking uh, computers. And of course, monitoring of computers. As it comes to administrative uh, procedures, of course, training is the most important part. Training uh, the research staff, confidentiality agreement should be done, and certificates of uh, confidentiality for the use of data, and to sign the non-disclosure non agreement. Uh, Ministry of Public Health emphasized the continuous education for IRB members, investigators, and of course public awareness to gain, uh, which is uh, Dr. Al Mohamed Ghali doing right now, uh, genetic counseling of course before, during, and after, and healthcare providers and insurance providers should be aware of what's happening as it comes to uh, genomic research. Uh, other genomic research challenges, uh, there are lots of them, uh, not only related to the quality of uh, information. Uh, there is, um, as I said, privacy. Uh, there is legal issues uh, that uh, might need some uh, guidance from religious scholars as it comes to paternity, uh, if something discovered during the genomic sequencing. Uh, economical, uh, maybe breach of data may affect having uh, his insurance for certain personnel. Uh, cultural and social stigmatization, of course, this is such a small country and everybody uh, can afford it if there is breach of data. Uh, psychological, of course, uh, if somebody has been diagnosed with a disease, it's not affecting him only, it's affecting uh, close family. Uh, if he's getting a disease with no treatment, how are we gonna deal with that? Uh, should we, should we not share, share the data with them or not? Lots of uh, complicated issues that needs to be addressed. Um, again, for the religious issue, paternity issue uh, could be also a problem. Uh, so what do we do as it comes to uh, incidental and secondary finding, which is a usual routine during genomic sequencing? And uh, I did a definition for uh, incidental finding and secondary finding. Uh, for example, a study participant uh, is in participating uh, in an investigation for the heart, and then they found another variant for Alzheimer's disease. Should we tell him about the Alzheimer's disease variants, or should we not? Uh, this is called incidental finding. Secondary finding, uh, it is additional looked for finding, uh, like when we do tissue typing uh, for kidney transplant between the father and his son, maybe uh, there is some um, unfavorable uh, result can happen or can be seen uh, in the process. So there is a still huge debate uh, about when, uh, when it is appropriate to uh, share results, what type of results should be shared, and how to return them. Uh, in 2013, the American College of Medical Genetics published a list of uh, almost 56 genes that deem medically actionable to be shared uh, with participants. And, um, uh, I believe it is started to be followed in the U.S. Uh, I believe Hamad Medical Center started to follow same procedures. Uh, however, the recommendation do not apply to researchers per se. So we're talking about these uh, 59 genes in the clinical setting, uh, in clinical laboratory that's completely accredited. So the results can be uh, 
valid as it comes to sensitivity and specificity. Uh, specificity. Uh, it should be also uh, help in the diagnosis and the direction treatment uh, of the uh, person. So what do we do? Should we really follow the ACGM uh, and just do that the clinician should inform a participant with this result or not? Or should we come with our own list of genetic variant? Uh, should the research institution in Qatar sit together and come up with their own list of related genetic variant? Uh, that's very, very important because by end of the day, uh, this list, only a small percentage of this genetic variant will actually manifest the disease uh, because of the rule of the environment and all that. So should we tell the patient or not? This is, this is a huge discussion that should be addressed. Also, there is a lack of data on population of non-European ancestry. So for example, uh, someone here, uh, or me, or whoever, has been diagnosed with uh, BRCA1, BRCA2, for example, for breast cancer, and then I go to the doctor and say, no, the variance is not significant because there isn't enough database in the Arab world that support that. So what do I do? with this result, it's useless to me. So really, uh, Arab uh, scientists in the Arab world should get together, make their own bank of data so we can relate somehow if somebody with Arabic background got a variance, they should go to that bank and see, is, is this variant gonna manifest a disease or not? Because we just cannot follow Western uh, data. Uh, I'm done. Okay, so uh, this is a list of uh, genetic variants in Qatar. I tried to communicate with some of the research institution. It came up with this list, and it's mostly uh, autosomal recessive or autosomal dominant. Uh, however, needs um, a lot of collaboration between scientists to sit together, get the genetic variant that's relevant to Qatar, and I'm sure if it is relevant to Qatar, it is relevant uh, to the Arab uh, world. Uh, religious and cultural uh, perspective, uh, of course, Dr. Mohammed Ghali talked about it uh, a lot. So, again, it's uh, the reporting to relatives. Uh, uh, is it, if it is not treatable, should we really tell the patient or not? Um, paternity issues in their tissue ownership. So, finding all these religious and cultural um, perspectives, we thought that there has to be another policy, not only the policy uh, we publish in our website, because it really has certain four tasks for the IRB and for the design. However, other issues have not been addressed as come to religious, culture, etc. Uh, so for future direction, we're gonna, uh, we are in the process to develop policies that will address the ethical, cultural, and religious aspect, uh, of course, with the help of Dr. Uh, Mohammed. Uh, develop genetic non-discrimination acts that would emphasize everybody's right to know his or her genetic background, to understand the implication of that, uh, to be assured that information is secured and will not be discriminated against, to have an equal access to healthcare services should a serious risk variant is detected, and to develop accreditation program for genomic sequencing lab. This is a huge issue also we need to work on. Thank you, and I'm ready for questions if needed. Thank you very much, Dr. Iman. Uh, now we move to the cream of the uh, of the talks today, because all what we have mentioned so far is, of course, meant uh, to be of help for the um, uh, Qatar Genome Program. Uh, I, I'm, I have known uh, the people uh, in this program since I arrived, since 2013, and I've seen uh, um, how um, significance they give for the um, issue of uh, policies, regulations, and ethics, which is, uh, Dr. Iman mentioned, one of the pillars of the, of the program. So now we will um, listen to uh, Dr. Saeed Ismail, please. Good morning. Now that you've seen me, I'm not sure I fit the description by Dr. Ghali <laughs> Cream. But anyway, thank you very much. Uh, 
Okay, so in the next 10, 15 minutes, I will uh, try to split basically uh, my talk into two parts. In the first part, I'll try to tell you about the exciting things we are doing. And in the other part, I'll try to blend in the theme of this uh, morning, which is the ethics and the regulations that, are, uh, that accompany such large-scale projects. Uh, and, and, and they are huge challenges. And I personally believe that the scientific research challenges, we can go through, we can go about them, and we can, we can, we can produce something. But the main challenges, I still believe, are going to be the ethical and the regulatory uh, issues related to such a large-scale genome project. This is not just a single patient going through the odyssey. And you can, if you listen from uh, Khaled, how difficult it is that sometimes you touch to, to, to give that answer to one family. This is a large-scale project, thousands and thousands of people, whole genome sequencing, a lot of data that you know, a lot of information that you know about this guy, or, or, or those, this, this cohort. So uh, the ethics and the regulatory, the ethical regulatory implications are huge, and the answers that have no question, no answers are, 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 are a lot. Not only in Qatar, but I go and speak to other such national programs, and they are still exploring the, the, the such implications, ethical, regulatory, social, and, and, and other. So I'll, I'll go very quickly through what we do in Qatar. And I'll just have to tell you that Qatar is one of a handful of nations who have started such large-scale national projects in a vision that will that Qatar will be one of the pioneers in the, implementations, in the implementation of uh, precision medicine. Such countries include uh, Estonia, uh, England, uh, Iceland, and, 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 and even the big players have only just started. So that includes China, the, the, the US, and, and Canada, and Australia. So we are in the Premier League, if you want, here in uh, Qatar. So these are the, the three objectives for this quick talk this morning. This is the vision and mission, basically, of Qatar Genome Project. Is again, to make Qatar a pioneer in the implementation of precision medicine. These are the seven building blocks or seven pillars that the genome project is built on. And we try all the time to work in parallel towards making progress on all of them. This is just a quick time frame. The vision was announced in WISH 2013, WISH people are here. So we always like to relate our project, the milestones, with the WISH. The announcement was in WISH December 2013. The end of the pilot phase was announced in WISH 2016. The end of phase one, the 10,000 genomes and the chip and other achievements were announced just a few, couple of months ago in WISH 2018. So these are quickly the phase one achievements. We've sequenced almost 13,000 whole genomes. And I think if you compare us to the national large-scale genome project. I think only two or three national genome projects sequenced more genomes than the Qatar genome project. And uh, so this was the first uh, achievement. Then the list goes uh, launching of the research consortium. I'll talk about that in a minute. Three rounds of the PPM research awards, the initiation of two graduate programs in Qatar University and HBKU, uh, working with the MOPH on drafting national policies, conducting national surveys, and uh, production of the Q-chip, as well as the genomic reports soon. So why do we think the Qatar Genome Project is one of the unique uh, projects that are there? Because Qatar, and, and it's a very similar example to Iceland. By the way, th this whole trend of large-scale national genome projects started in Iceland in the 90s, 10, 15 years before everybody else, because everybody thought that Iceland is the ideal place to, to, to initiate such large-scale projects where the, it's a small population with a centralized healthcare system, and the genetics of that population is more homogeneous than other populations. And Qatar is in a perfect situation, as Iceland was there, to, 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 again, to venture into this, uh, this, this project. So it's a small population with a centralized healthcare system. All major stakeholders are on board. We work with everyone in, in, in Qatar. And this, the, the infrastructure, whether it's the, the sequencing or the bioinformatics infrastructure in, in Qatar is, this state, is at state of the art. 
Qataris represent not only this small nation on the Arabian Gulf, but they represent the whole of Arabia and even beyond. I estimated that to be around 80 to 100 million people who share a lot of their genomics with uh, Qatar. So this part of the world, which is a bit dark when you talk about the, genomic, the international genomic part, will, uh, the, the QGB will shed some light and, 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 and the whole world is interested basically about the results that are coming out of this. Uh, and the high consanguinity rate, of course, is another advantage that will uh, push for more discoveries, hopefully. Quickly, I'll go through those seven building blocks or seven pillars that we work on in parallel. Again, the, the most important is the Qatar Biobank because it's not just the genomic data, it's also the deep phenotypic data that is collected in Qatar Biobank that makes our uh, project uh, special. And then it's the strategic partnership with SIDRA. Most of the, all of the sequencing actually and the bioinformatics work happens here at uh, SIDRA, and we are uh, yani, glad to have th such strong partnership with, the, with the, with the, all the talent that, that is there here in SIDRA. Uh, the third pillar is the genomic research, and we, we encourage that through two ways. One is this, this consortium, the QGB consortium, 100 plus uh, researchers in Qatar from all around the local institutes are involved in this consortium. And the other uh, arm by which we fund research or encourage genomic research is the PPMs, the Pathway Towards Precision Medicine Awards in collaboration with the QNRF. And the third call, by the way, the channel was open, I think, just a couple of days ago, and uh, you, anyone interested is, is, is more than welcome to apply. We are also, well, through those PIs or researchers that we work, to, we work with, have international collaborations with the best centers around the world, whether it's in the US, the UK, or other places in Europe. We focus on whole genome sequencing, but we also encourage other omics analysis. Uh, and, and, and Khalid put it beautifully when he showed you that big elephant. Indeed, with genomics alone is not enough. So this is how we try to encourage other omics, whether it's proteomics, transcriptomics, epigenomics, micro, through the PPMs, basically, and other one-to-one -one partnerships, whether it's QGB or QBB. The fourth and one of the most important uh, pillars of this project is the, uh, the policies and the regulations and the ethics, the ethics and we are uh, yani privileged to have strong, uh, to, to work closely with Dr. Iman and her team and also with Dr. Uh, Ghali. Uh, we are happy that this, this document was, was there. This is one of the first and early documents that are produced by the AMO PH, and we hope for more. Uh, we took part in this uh, WISH document, the Precision Medicine, a Global Action Plan for Impact. Another WISH document led by Dr. Ghali, the Genomics in the Gulf Region and Islamic Ethics. Uh, our last conference last April was the main theme was on ethics and regulations again, and the turnout was huge, which shows the, the interest in the ethics and, reg and regulations and the social Im implications that, that surround such uh, projects. Uh, the fifth pillar is the building human capacity, and as I said, we worked with uh, Hamad bin Khalifa and Qatar University to, to uh, launch two programs. The one in Qatar University is on genetic counseling, and the other at HBKU was in genomic and precision medicine. We also tried to, out, to reach out to school students at an earlier age through uh, regular visits at the DNA Museum at Mshareb. The fifth, the sixth uh, pillar is, is to do with clinical implementation, and in the next five years, we are supposed to be shifting more from basic research to clinical implementation. In this transition period, we, we are trying to show some examples where genomics can have impact at the clinical side. And among these examples, uh, the personal genomic reports we are going to produce and deliver to Qatar Biobank participants. Another good example is the Q-chip, which we've developed version one of in, co in close collaboration with, with colleagues from the Biobank, uh, Qatar, uh, Wild Cornell, SIDRA, and HMC. This again will show that this is the Q-chip, the Qatari chip, where, the, where we summarize the Qatari relevant mutations 
put them in a chip and hopefully use, use it in research or in clinical diagnosis. Another example to show impact at the clinical side at this stage is, is, is the heart project, the, 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 the 1,000 Qatari patients, uh, the, the QC bio, that's, that's a bio repository collected by Dr. Jassim Swedi. And one next uh, project we are keen to work on because this is at the heart of what we are talking about today. And I'll use that to stop now and tell you how are we, for, for, for me personally, I think this is a, a very good learning example that will shed light not only on the science behind it, but also on the ethical and regulatory problems. So the story goes as follows. La most large scale genome projects are research projects. And there is a constant that says that you do not have the, 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 the obligation to return back clinical data or clinically relevant information back to the patient because it's a research project and he signed that consent. In Qatar, we have someone called Muhammad Ghali who came to us once and said, no, you, you, you don't have to stick to this contract if it's a life-threatening mutation and it is actionable. So, uh, uh, and since then, again, he, he, he gave me personally sleepless nights saying that, because another scientist was telling me during the same time that I knew of 20 to 30 ladies in your cohort who are BRCA1 carriers, meaning that th th they're most likely going to have breast cancer early in their lives. And mo m most of them do not know that they are carriers, most likely. And there's a lot that you can do about. And then we find the clinical partner who is very much willing to take that responsibility off our shoulders. Just give me those 20, 30 patients and I'll deal with them. I have a national screening programs and program and I have a cancer genetic counselor and, and, and everything. The, set, the, the, the stage is set to start reporting on incidental findings on actionable uh, mutations. But it doesn't stop here. This is one of the most well-characterized examples where you can do something and you can see impact and you can feel good about it. But there are so many other things that you can report on. This is whole genome sequencing. And, and, and you know a lot about those 13, 14, 15,000 uh, individuals. And, and, but then on the other side, you can just say, I'm a research project. But then you have a moral obligation. But you can't do it. You're a clinical. I'm talking to myself. You, 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 you're not a healthcare provider. You're a, you're a research project. We'll just throw it on their side. As, as one scholar told me in that conference, by the way, you just tell them it's their responsibility. But they are overwhelmed in HMC. They, they are busy with their, with their normal and routine and, 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 and the, the, the huge number of patients who are swarming their clinics let alone us at Qatar Genome Project telling them about yani referring thousands of different mutations that they are actually do not know how to deal with. I'll give you one more story. The, the, the breast cancer one was, was the easiest one. I'll give you one more story. Last year in the US, there was this family that lost a child early age, sudden death. It was a heart problem. Then they were worried about then his brother. Or, uh, so what they did is they, they went through this diagnostic odyssey. They found the mutation. What can we do to the other child? Pacemaker. Serious decision. Few months later, that was based on a paper published in a high-impact journal, a very well-respected one. Months down the line, another group says, no, it wasn't that mutation that causes this sudden death or, or this heart attack or whatever it is. It was too late for that child. The base maker is already there. So the, what I'm saying is that there is plenty of mutations that are being associated to, dis to disease, but it's still in the gray zone. What happens now is that from this gray zone, they might move to be yeah, it's classified as benign or pathogenic. And what, 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 what your moral obligation is, what your moral obligation at this point of time might change as time goes by. So what is, what if you say that I am only reporting on life-threatening mutations that are actionable now, what about a year later? 
those mutations that are actionable and life-threatening might change. Do I have then the, 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 the obligation to go back to my records and see what diseases have now been associated beyond doubt with this variant and then report that? You, uh, you need a small army to keep looking into that database when you have all those maybe in the future tens of thousands of individuals. And, and so we need, we need a, a very clear set of regulations and a very clear set of ethical uh, guidelines. I'll go quickly through the, uh, the surveys we've conducted uh, recently. We've conducted two large-scale national uh, surveys, one uh, for the public and the other for the healthcare professionals. And uh, there are two huge surveys. I'll just go through some of the results that are of, might be of interest. So basically, this slide says that most of the public are interested and intrigued. They want to know more about their genetic makeup. And when we're asked the direct question, would you like then to donate a sample or participate in a national project like the Qatar Genome Project, most of them said yes. So people want to know about their genetics. With regards to the professionals, uh, 97 of those respondents, many of which are healthcare professionals here in Sidra, said, yes, I do believe that the way forward is precision medicine. This will make an impact at my, uh, in my, my daily practice. And, and, and when, when asked, are they willing to, so no, I'm going backwards. When asked then, are you willing to, uh, to enroll in, in, in training or uh, continuous education related to genomics? Most of them said, yes, we do need that. And when, the, we were, uh, when they were asked about the obstacles, basically they've identified, mainly the two main obstacles were lack of time, obviously, and the second main obstacle was the lack of genetic counselors. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Saeed, and thanks for all the presenters. Uh, we have like 10, 15 minutes. Uh, if, um, uh, before I set the, the stage for uh, uh, questions or remarks from your side, I just want to say this is just the flavor. This is the beginning. We have a three-year project to work on. Uh, um, with collaboration of uh, many other researchers. Some of them are already on board, others are on the way to join the project. Uh, um, uh, not just questions, if you have questions, but if you have any remarks, suggestions that can help us, that you think that uh, this must be worked on uh, uh, during a project like this, trying to connect between Islamic ethics and genomics on one hand, and public, engaging the public, raising public awareness on the other hand. Um, if any of you is um, uh, ready to help uh, throughout this uh, project, just let, uh, let us know. Um, and now I um, leave you with the um, speakers if you have any questions or remarks or suggestions. Who wants to start? Yes, please. Uh, is, there, is there a mic here that we can give to the audience? Yes, please. Just a second. No, for the for the translation for the translation. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Please. So so very very nice overview. Uh, one question for the whole panel: um, Where is the public in all of this? Besides the survey that Said presented at the end, I mean, there are Sharia regulations, there are ethicists, there are the scientists on one end. But how are we engaging the public in terms of saying, and, and the level of, of uh, risk, if you will, or willingness to know about actionable, non-actionable mutation might be even at the individual's level. Are we engaging focus groups of uh, uh, people on the ground to say, you know, what's, what's your level of interest? What's your level of uh, wanting to know? You know, and, and then taking that into account as we you know, deal with um, incidental findings in the QGP or, or other clinical settings? 
So I'll answer very quickly that a Qatar Genome Project, like for example the Icelandic project or other, or we, we are a population-based project. We go, we operate through the biobank, and these are uh, self-identified healthy individuals. Other other projects which are more disease-based, like the Genomics England one, I think they do it through the the the. They have three region, 13 regional centers called the GMCs to produce the reports. Each district has one center called the G uh, Genomic Medicine Center. They, they produce the, the report, and if it's complicated, they have the MDTs, multidisciplinary teams who will sort of yeah, and discuss the result and then convey the message to the, to the patient. So what I'm saying now is that this is how you communicate it back to the patient. To the public, that, that, that's a whole different story. You need an awareness campaigns, you need to go to schools, you need to, 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 to have videos at your website, you need to, to do a lot to raise the awareness generally about genomic medicine, not a specific disease. But, so if it's a disease, it's, it's happening through the clinical healthcare providers. For us as a national project, the only thing I can see us doing is, is engaging with schools, universities, and, and, and uh, videos, TV, and programs, and all these things, yes. Uh, just to add a little bit to, to this, uh, thanks. Uh, this is our third Khalid. So we have three Khalids today <laughs> uh, from Will Cornell, who is also one of the organizers of this uh, event and one of our uh, partners for the future as well, uh, inshallah. I just want to add that uh, in, in the project we are working on, the, the PPM project, uh, discussing this issue of public engagement and raising public awareness, we are also partnering with um, international uh, uh, bodies who have experience in this, like the Wellcome Trust in England, who have experience in this. We have also on board, uh, unfortunately, some of them couldn't come, uh, but we have researchers whose specialization is uh, social science, anthropology, uh, uh, in um, understanding the techniques and, and uh, complexities of public awareness and public engagement about genomics in Muslim world context, who will also work on this. So there are many others, there are also social media Media that will start soon, but we thought the, the, the first place to start with are the people who have contact either with the research subjects or with the patients as clinicians or as scientists to work on this and to share with them our ideas in the beginning. But thank you very much for your question. So, uh, do you have another yeah, question? Yeah, so a quick yeah. comment uh, back to the question of how do you report the data. So from local experience, and I'm sure Dr. Muhammad and Dr. Khaled as well, uh, through the Cornell IRB, we've dealt with it. Uh, to link the issue of incidental findings in the research setting back to the, to the patient, what we've done on a case-by-case -case basis is before reporting back to the patient, the sample, a new sample is collected from the patient through the clinician and then sequenced in a CLIA-certified lab independently, uh, blindly, to confirm before you go back. Because, you know, although the error rate is very small, it's possible. So that's a potential mechanism to minimize false negatives, if you will. A quick comment. The, the, the biobank have a referral system. They, they have a, if you're talking about research, then going to the clinic. Okay, yeah. The, the biobank have a referral system whereby they, they have specific channels with, the, with HMC where they can refer people to. Uh, one uh, other way to handle this one is in the consent form where, you know, they consent that, you know, information, such information could be uh, revolved. And uh, nowadays we are, uh, you know, they are thinking also to put uh, the last story that you mentioned that, you know, uh, this is based on certain analysis, but there could be another mutation or something else. So the information given is not 100 percent sometimes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Yes, Dr. Walid. Uh, can you pass the, the microphone, please? Yeah. Um, my question is, uh, typically when you develop policies and regulations, usually, in general, it sort of lags behind in terms of the progress of science. Science is a fast pace and technology gets developed. So what types of sort of mechanisms or uh, what type of guards are we developing so that um, science does not outpace the sort of uh, ethical, regulatory, as well as uh, policy. An example of that, probably in the news the last week or so, you saw 
the uh, Chinese scientists that uh, uh, did the uh, genomic uh, editing experiment, and uh, pregnancies are, are, are the result of that, of uh, developing babies with uh, edited genomes. So, um, so where we are in terms of uh, this uh, futuristic thinking? Uh, it's very important that in each country that conduct research to gain public trust that these researches or research activities, any type of human research activities, including genomic research, to be done in the highest ethical and scientific standard. And to ensure that the government has to ensure the public by developing national policies and regulation that govern the ethical conduct of any type of research, as, as I said, in Qatar, Qatar is very advanced in this regard. It has their own policies for human research, animal research, and even uh, basic research. Genomic research is no different than any other uh, human research activities, stem cell or gene transfer or, or other. Every type of this research activity has its own policy, has its own criteria, has its own more safeguard to research participant. As it comes to genomics per se, as we said, the policy we have right now in our website help, first of all, the investigator to design its genomic research plan, how to mitigate the risk, how to ensure that informed consent contain all the element that will protect its privacy and confidentiality, uh, to tell him where the data, where we're going, how long it will archive, is there a secondary use or not. If there is a plan in case of incidental finding, how the research lab will deal with that. For the time being, we have we said to researchers there is no obligation whatsoever to share the research incidental finding unless you make sure that there are three criteria has been done, which is analytical validity, clinical validity, and also actionable. So you make sure that the uh, genomic sequencing has gone in accredited, you know, a, a CAB accredited or whatever, uh, research laboratories. It's not any laboratories can do sequencing and get result and share it with subjects. They have to make sure these are credible data to be shared. Also, there has to be counseling before, during, and after to indicate to participants what type of disease they have, what is the effect of that disease on their own family, uh, family member, on himself. Uh, are these variants really relative or not? Will this variant will manifest the disease or not? Because even, you know, uh, how many of you have done uh, 23 and me genetic uh, sequencing? Okay, was it useful for you, for example? Was it useful? How? Uh, for certain people, they're very supportive of that because it tells you you have this type of variance. However, if you are an Arab, there isn't enough data. There isn't enough Arab genomic data to tell you are these variants are important or not. So I consider it really useless at this point. Yeah, it will tell you you have a tendency to have diabetes, you have a tendency to have Alzheimer, you have tendency, but, but again, only a small percentage will manifest these diseases depending also on interaction with the environment and many lifestyle, <coughs> any other factor. Uh, Thank you. I think uh, Khaled also wanted to add something because uh, unfortunately we have to um, uh, finish and, and give the room to Sidra in, in, in a minute or something. We don't want to upset them so that they give us the auditorium again. So they need it for another event. So I, I will leave the last thing for Khaled. Please. So, yeah, so thanks for that question. I think there's always, as a scientist, I have to preface, I'm very passionate about innovation, right? And I think that, that that's one of the most important, <laughs> if you take anything away from, from, from my talk, it's that scientific innovation will always be ongoing and will always pose its own ethical questions. Now, um, the thing about scientists is that we're sneaky. Right? We're going to figure out a way to do it. And, uh, I mean, the Chinese thing, allegedly, right, um, the, 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 with, the, with, the, with, the, with the genome editing, we're not sure if this is true or not. We're not sure. We're not even sure where this guy disappeared to, right? 
Um, but um, uh, you know, but I think that um, you know, to make to make the example more real, right? Um, the moral ethical um, debate that surrounded embryonic stem cell, for example, without the ban on embryonic stem cell, then scientists would never have discovered induced pluripotent stem cells. Now, and this is a huge discovery, right? So, you know, before when you had a baby, you'd be asked if you want to cord blood the bank, right? Bank the cord blood, right? For future possibilities of something, right? Today we know that that, that procedure is not really necessary. I can take a, a skin cell from you and I can reverse it into an, a, a stem cell state and then take it all the way back. So the fact that that can be done with four simple factors, which won the Nobel Prize, it was a huge discovery, which would not have been ever possible or ever even conceived of had it not been, had there not been a, a ban on, on embryonic stem cells. So that's the thing is, this, this constant cycle between innovation and ethics, it's gonna just keep going and going and going, right? And, <coughs> and, and, and you can't really limit both. Both are very important, but I think for society to advance, we have to be cognizant, we have to be morally um, you know, upright, but at the same time, we have to give some leeway for these advancements. Okay, thank you, Khal, very much, and thanks for uh, you for attending the session, and thanks for Dr. Walid who asked the last question. This is one of the questions he will work on because he's also part of the project, so he has a lot of uh, homework to do also the coming years. Thank you very much, and uh, hopefully we will uh, see you on other occasions. Uh, we have our uh, international conference uh, um, uh, of the Research Center for Islamic Legislation and Ethics, which will be which, uh, will be soon more information also will be available on the um, table outside. Uh, just uh, um, follow us on our uh, website, kylecenter.org, and uh, our social media, Facebook and Twitter, to know more about our events. Thank you very much, and have a nice day. Assalamu alaikum.